Thank you very much, Joe. It is a great pleasure to be here. First of all, I apologize for my jeans. I came to Chicago this morning and my bag went to Philadelphia and we haven't uh, <laughs> caught up yet. Um, so we're going to talk about giant cell arteritis, which is a disease that at long last we have made some great progress in over the past couple of years. So I'm going to start by telling you about a patient I evaluated for the first time uh, about four years ago. Um, he is a 58-year-old man who lived in a town very close to me uh, near Boston. And his chief complaint was two months of decreased energy. Specifically, he could no longer play tennis, which he enjoyed uh, doing several times a week. And his other symptom was that he had a dry, non-productive cough. And he was referred to me by his uh, primary care doctor who had evaluated him for several weeks before realizing maybe a rheumatologist would know the answer. And in, he had evaluated the patient with some labs. The patient had a normochromic, normocytic anemia, very elevated acute phase reactants. And then because of the cough and the elevated acute phase reactants, had undergone chest and abdominal CT scanning, which was unremarkable. So I knew all of this before I saw the patient. Uh, so when I saw the patient, I asked him very carefully, do you have any headache? No. Any vision symptoms? Any polymyalgia rheumatica? Any jaw claudication? And the answer to all of those was no. And I examined him very carefully, feeling his peripheral pulses, and listening with my stethoscope over his subclavian arteries uh, and his uh, femoral arteries for bruise, didn't find anything. But I remembered this paper uh, from long ago, uh, 1984. I wasn't even born then. And uh, it was from Mayo Clinic, where so much great stuff in giant cell arteritis has come from. And this paper from Gene Hunter's group reported that respiratory tract symptoms could be a clue to occult giant cell arteritis. And um, one of the uh, symptoms reported in this paper was a dry, non-productive cough. So I was very suspicious that this patient might have GCA. So the question in my mind and the question in your mind when you see patients like this or similar to this patient, is a temporal artery biopsy the next step for this patient? <clears throat> so what is the sensitivity of temporal artery biopsy in this setting or in any setting? Well, again, another paper from a long, long time ago, uh, 1983, and again from the Mayo Clinic, addressed this question, I think as well as it has been uh, addressed. Uh, these investigators, again, Gene Hunter's group, evaluated 134 residents of Olmsted County who had undergone temporal artery biopsy at the Mayo Clinic over a 15-year period, 1965 to 1980. And 46 of these biopsies, or about a third of them, were positive. The 80, other 88 were negative. And all of the patients who had biopsies were then followed for about six years after that. These were the signs and symptoms associated with a positive biopsy in those 46 patients who had positive temporal artery biopsies. And it tells me a lot that I think is important about GCA. So first of all, jaw claudication was present in more than half of the patients with a positive biopsy. This is important, and I'll say more about that in just a second. Uh, the second is that only two-thirds of those who had a uh, positive temporal artery biopsy had an abnormal temporal artery on physical examination. So the, the examination could be completely normal, but the biopsy would turn out to be positive. Now, jaw claudication is an important symptom, and I think it's under appreciated even by rheumatologists because patients don't come to our offices saying, Doc, I'm having jaw claudication today. They don't recognize that the pain they have in their cheek when they chew that happens very fast 
is a very important and rather specific sign or symptom. So uh, we see how specific it is when we realize that only 3% of those patients who had negative biopsies had jaw claudication. So jaw claudication is a very important symptom, and we really need to try to tease that symptom out. This is another point to make about these signs and symptoms, and one of the reasons diagnosing GCA is so difficult. All of these other features that we think of being pretty typical of GCA uh, were no more common among the patients who had positive biopsies than they were among those who had biopsies that were negative. All of these things were not particularly helpful in differentiating who was going to have a, temp a positive temporary biopsy and who was not. My patient didn't have any of these things, nothing. These were the list of symptoms that we commonly think about being associated with GCA. He didn't have a single one of them. So among those 88 patients with negative biopsies, what was the actual diagnosis? What did the diagnosis turn out to be? This is also interesting. So eight of those 88 patients turned out to have giant cellulitis. And sometimes that was diagnosed at autopsy. Sometimes it was diagnosed when the patient uh, went to um, repair of aortic regurgitation several years later and was found to have giant cell arteritis in the aorta. And the other patients had a variety of other diseases. A lot of them just had PMR, and some had other forms of vasculitis. So this tells us that the sensitivity of temporal artery biopsy, even when the biopsies are done at the Mayo Clinic, where they do them, I think, better than any place, the sensitivity is only 85%. So patients can certainly have a negative temporal artery biopsy and still have GCA. I don't think there's been a better study addressing this question. There are a lot of reasons for negative temporal artery biopsies. There can be skip lesions. Uh, sometimes the biopsy performed is not uh, long enough. Sometimes they don't biopsy the correct part of the um, artery, and sometimes the pathology interpretation is simply wrong. Sometimes it's granulomatosis with polyangiitis rather than giant cell arteritis, and the pathologist uh, sometimes flub that one. In the GIACTA trial, um, a fifth of the patients had PMR symptoms only. All of the patients in the trial had giant cell arteritis, but a fifth of the patients in that trial had no cranial symptoms whatsoever, and their only symptom uh, uh, of giant cell arteritis was PMR. So 52 out of the 251 patients enrolled had no cranial symptoms, and among these, imaging alone was the key to the diagnosis. 80% of those patients with PMR manifestations of GCA only were diagnosed by large vessel imaging. And imaging has, is clearly playing um, uh, an increasingly prominent role in our diagnosis of this disease now. Over the last 29 years now, since the American College of Rheumatology classification criteria uh, for GCA were formulated, imaging has undergone revolution after revolution in, in looking at large vessels. And in the GIACTA trial, it, um, more than a third of the patients enrolled did, either did not, have a temp, did not have a temporal artery biopsy or had a biopsy and it was negative and the diagnosis was made on the basis of imaging, PET scan, MRA, CTA. So what about for my patient, ultrasound? Ultrasound was not an option in the GIACTA trial. And uh, many of you may be very facile with ultrasound, and maybe you can get an ultrasound very quickly in your clinic. I'm not facile with ultrasound. I can't get an ultrasound uh, quickly uh, in my clinic. So although ultrasound is growing and will, ass will assume a larger role, I'm certain, it wasn't an option for me when I saw this patient four years ago. So what I decided to do was to do a PET scan on the patient. I thought it would be a waste of time to do a temporal artery biopsy uh, in him, so 
I jumped through the hoops needed to get a PET scan. And um, while waiting to get the PET scan scheduled, I thought, should I be starting this patient on steroids now? He's got giant cell arteritis. I feel in my gut that he has it. Shouldn't I start him on steroids? Tough, tough choice, but I didn't want to decrease the sensitivity of the PET, so he didn't have any cranial symptoms at all, and I didn't start him on prednisone. And I got away with it, and this was his PET scan, floridly positive aortitis. It had to be positive, and, and it was, fortunately. If it hadn't been, I don't know what I would have done next. Um, and this is the rest of the PET scan, despite the fact that I had palpated his peripheral pulses very carefully and listened for bruies. Uh, he had disease in his subclavian arteries, just as so many patients with GCA do, but it had not resulted in a diminution of his pulses. So the PET scan was key to clinching the diagnosis in this case. So how to treat now? or how to treat four years ago. The GIACTA trial, which we're going to talk about in a minute, was going on, um, but we didn't know the results. And so I opted to treat him, as I think most of you would have done, with 60 milligrams of prednisone a day, and I plan to taper it over six months. Maybe that's faster than many of you would have done, but that's what I uh, proposed to do. Now, glucocorticoids, no matter where we are in the world treating inflammatory disease, we're talking about the patient is in front of us and we're talking about st the steroids, we always use the same uh, metaphor. We talk about steroids being a double-edged sword because there's nothing that controls inflammation more quickly than steroids, probably. But as any patient who's been on it for more than 48 hours will tell you, um, over time, steroids become as much a uh, curse as a blessing. You all have patients who look like this young man, 18 years old, who uh, had been on high doses of steroids for two years before I saw him. His body weight had increased by 50%. He gained 75 pounds. Um, you can see uh, that he's got hirsutism and acne. All of this in, uh, to treat inflammation in his extraocular muscles. All of that systemic effect to treat a very, very small area of inflammation. And these were the striae, which he had developed, which he will carry with him the rest of his life, a permanent scar and reminder of his episode with steroids. And he rightly asked me, is treatment worse than the disease? And this is what GCA patients ask us too, after they've been on steroids. And of course, they're not 18-year-old boys. They're more likely to be 78-year-old women who already have a lot of comorbidities that makes long-term steroid use challenging. So glucocorticoid toxicity, the uh, toxicities of uh, these drugs are truly staggering, and they're sort of like uh, wallpaper. Um, they just sort of go on behind the scenes, and up until now, they've been viewed uh, as a necessary evil. This is only a partial list of the effects of these drugs. So despite all of those effects, how often does prednisone fail? So I've just put this 58-year-old this, uh, man on 60 milligrams of prednisone a day. W is it going to work? Am I going to be able to get him off steroids? How often does prednisone fail? And this is a really remarkable question that we, four years ago, did not know the answer to, despite the fact that we had had glucocorticoids as the standard of care treatment for giant cell arteritis as a cornerstone of so many of our other inflammatory diseases. For 70 years, we didn't know the answer to this question. So to get to this question, I'm going to tell you about patient two. 
Patient two I met on October 20th, 2010 at 7 a.m. I had just arrived at work. I was looking forward to sitting down at my desk and catching up on email for about an hour before I had to uh, go round when my beeper went off. And it was from the cardiac ICU. And the surgeon at the other end of the line said, Dr. Stone, you got to come see this patient right now. And I said, okay, what's the patient's name? Richard Higgins. And lights went off in my head because I had been corresponding with Richard Higgins, who lived in upstate New York, for about three weeks. And Mr. Higgins had told me that he had refractory giant cell arteritis, that he had been on high doses of steroids for nine months, and his disease would not quiet down. And I said, Mr. Higgins, uh, we will get you into clinic as soon as we can. So we were looking uh, for a, um, uh, an appointment to see Mr. Higgins. And the night before I got that page, Mr. Higgins had forced the issue by developing a tearing pain between his shoulder blades and going to the emergency room there and then enduring a six-hour ambulance ride through Massachusetts to our emergency room um, where he had this chest x-ray done, which I looked at when I was talking with the surgeon, and you'll note the widened mediastinum, and I thought, why are you calling rheumatology? This patient should be in the operating room right now. And then I continued further with the computer biopsy, and I realized why the surgeon had called rheumatology. That is because Mr. Higgins had a huge aneurysm right at the top of his aortic arch, looking like it would burst any minute. And if I were a vascular surgeon, I would also want a little bit of help trying to calm that down before diving in and trying to fix it. So that's why they called rheumatology. <clears throat> so as I was walking to the ICU to see Mr. Higgins, I thought, what are we going to do? Does any treatment aside from steroids work in giant cell arteritis? What about methotrexate? I participated in this trial uh, published uh, about 14 or 15 years ago now, um, indicating that 75% of patients treated with methotrexate flared within one year. No uh, difference statistically between that and the 91% of, of prednisone-only treated patients who flared within one year. And almost 60% of patients treated with methotrexate uh, had two flares within one year. So methotrexate was not the drug that was going to calm Mr. Higgins' aortitis down and get him to the operating room. Neither was infliximab, another trial that I had participated in. And uh, this trial had demonstrated uh, no difference between the prednisone and infliximab um, plus prednisone groups. In fact, only 20% of the patients in both groups were in remission at one year. So I didn't know what we were going to do. And this was Mr. Higgins on the day that I met him, or very close to it. And you can see Mr. Higgins had been extremely compliant with his prednisone. He hadn't missed a single dose, a single milligram of prednisone for nine months. And I confirmed the history. He had indeed been on high doses for nine months. <clears throat> and this was his aorta and his aneurysm. And the surgeon said, cool him down so that we can take him to the operating room. So, uh, I scratched my head for a while, and then I remembered this paper from the late, uh, from the year 2000, from, again, from the Mayo Clinic, Connie Wyan's group when she was there, describing IL-6 as being an important biomarker in giant cell arteritis. And ever since then, I had kind of wondered, wanted to be able to inhibit IL-6 in treating giant cell arteritis. But that hadn't been possible over the next decade because there was nothing available to do it. Only a week before I met Mr. Higgins, however, tocilizumab had been approved for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis by the FDA. <clears throat> 
And it dawned on me, that's what we're going to do. It was a perfect situation. It was a desperate situation for Mr. Higgins. He was in the ICU. His aorta might rupture at any minute. <coughs> because he was in the hospital, I didn't have to get prior authorization for the drug. That was key. <coughs> I had read about um, what happened, what should happen when you interfere with uh, IL-6. So uh, tocilizumab inhibits the IL-6 receptor. There's a membrane-bound uh, uh, receptor, and there's also soluble IL-6 receptor circulating in the blood, and tocilizumab binds to both the membrane-bound and the circulating uh, receptor and outcompetes uh, the cytokine for the receptor, thereby inhibiting the signal transduction that occurs when the cytokine binds to its receptor and blocking a whole lot of downstream effects. And I knew that the acute phase reactants were supposed to be squashed very quickly and that the IL-6 concentration was supposed to soar. But I had never given tocilizumab uh, myself, even to a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. So these were Mr. Higgins' acute phase reactants when he was admitted on the 20th. Despite being on 60 milligrams of prednisone a day, he had striking elevations of his acute phase reactants. He got his tocilizumab on the uh, 21st, and then on the 22nd, we measured his acute phase reactants again, and I thought, this is a big dud, just like methotrexate and infliximab. It doesn't work. But then the next day, there was some movement in the acute phase reactants, and then every day subsequent to the time Mr. Higgins went to surgery, his acute phase reactants fell. This was astonishing, jaw-dropping. I had never seen anything like it. The surgeon said, Stone is a genius, and uh, they don't say that very much. Uh, and this was happening at a time when we were coming down on his prednisone to get him ready for surgery. A few days after we gave him his tocilizumab, we measured his serum IL-6, and his serum IL-6 had soared as what everything that I thought I understood about the physiology and the kinetics of IL-6 indicated it should. So this experience led directly to the GIACTA trial, and I'll come back to Mr. Higgins at the end. Here's the trial design. There were four groups. Two of them received prednisone only. One of them received only a 26-week prednisone taper. And uh, if the patient completed the taper, continued on no therapy until the primary outcome was measured uh, at 52 weeks. The second prednisone group received a full year of prednisone therapy. Uh, there were two tocilizumab groups, both of which received uh, 162 milligram doses. One received that every week, the other received it every other week, and both of those tocilizumab groups um, received a six-month prednisone course as well. So how often does prednisone fail? This trial finally gave us the answer to that question after 70 years. Frequently is the answer. And more specifically, um, in the 26-week prednisone only group, only 14% of the patients achieve the primary outcome of disease remission and off steroids at one year. And only 18% of those in one f the arm receiving one full year of prednisone achieve the primary outcome. That is an astonishingly high failure rate. And I think the reason we didn't all appreciate it and didn't know that it would be that high is because in practice, we haven't taken patients off prednisone. We've just let them stay on 5 to 10 milligrams a day or more. The duration of prednisone mattered very little. Uh, so this uh, curve shows the cumulative prednisone doses in the two prednisone-only treatment arms. And you can see that the yellow arm, the 26-week the prednisone taper, um, wound up receiving just as much prednisone at the end of a year as did the patients in the 52-week taper. 
those in the shorter taper just flared and got escaped steroids and uh, caught up. This slide shows some really interesting data that one has to think about, but I think I understand why. And it tells us something very interesting about giant cell arteritis. So in the patients in the 26-week only prednisone arm, nine of the flares that occurred occurred when patients were on zero milligrams of prednisone a day. In contrast, in the patients who received one full year of prednisone, none of the flares occurred uh, when patients were on zero milligrams a day. What this tells us is that as patients are coming down on their prednisone dose, and they get down to 12 and a half or 10 or 7 and a half milligrams a day, their disease is starting to heat up. It's subclinical still for a while, so they don't recognize it, and neither do you. But when, uh, if they're on a short prednisone taper, they will get all the way to zero before they have a clinically obvious flare. And that's why you see so many flares at zero milligrams a day in the 26-week only group. In contrast, uh, patients on a somewhat longer taper flare before they get to zero milligrams a day. There are plenty of flares in both groups. In fact, 60% of the patients treated with prednisone only flared within one year. Um, so my patient one failed prednisone. Or more precisely, prednisone failed him. It's not his fault. Prednisone failed him, as it so often does. Two months after tapering off his prednisone, his fatigue returned. His acute phase reactants were sky high again. His PET scan, which had normalized, uh, showed great decrease in his FVG uptake. Now again showed increased FVG upta uptake in those areas. So I put him on tocilizumab then. What could he expect with that? Well, the giant cell, the, the GIACTA trial, um, confirmed that tocilizumab um, is very, very good compared to prednisone alone at helping patients achieve sustained uh, remissions at one year. Didn't matter which um, tocilizumab group it was. They both did much better than prednisone alone. <coughs> Were the results of this trial driven by the fact that the, result, that the definition of remission was normalization of the CRP? That certainly could have biased the trial heavily in favor of tocilizumab. But this uh, CRP part of the definition was applied in the analysis phase, and the investigators still don't know what their the CRP levels of their patients were. So a sensitivity analysis, which removed CRP from the definition of remission, demonstrated that the results were not driven by the CRP um, and that uh, this is a very important figure to remember, 33.3%. This is the likelihood that if you diagnose a patient with giant arteritis on Monday and treat her with prednisone for one full year, you can tell her she has only a third of a chance of being in remission and off steroids at one year. And that's even if you completely ignore the CRP. 33.3%. Tocilizumab also controlled the disease fast. This is a very interesting slide. So, most of the patients in the four uh, GIACTA treatment groups were in remission by the time of their baseline visit. And that's because there was a six-week screening period and patients were treated with steroids during that time. So most of them had already achieved remission. But if you look um, as soon as two months out, the tocilizumab groups are already starting to separate themselves from uh, the prednisone only treatment groups. And the difference was even more striking among patients who had relapsing disease uh, at baseline compared with newly diagnosed disease. So tocilizumab works fast. <laughs>
it really does add something, of, uh, add some speed uh, to, to the glucocorticoids treatment response. Tocilizumab had a very significant steroid sparing effect. Uh, this was the curve that I showed you earlier of the prednisone-only treatment groups and, um, I'm sorry, the prednisone-only treatment groups here, um, and there's a nice plateauing um, of prednisone use in the two tocilizumab groups. Tocilizumab was very safe in this patient population. No new safety signals emerged. And really, the only thing of note was that patients in the two prednisone-only treatment groups were more likely to have a serious adverse event than were those treated with tocilizumab plus steroids. When should IL-6 inhibition begin? Remember this, 33.3%. That is the likelihood that a patient will be in remission and off steroids at one year even if you treat them for a full year and only stop the steroids the day before. What usually happens, of course, is that patients go into remission on steroids, and then at month seven, when you get them down to 10 milligrams a day, they flare, and you've got to go back up to a high, higher dose, just compounding the steroid toxicity. Tocilizumab was not invariably successful in these patients, and this is very important to remember. It works wonderfully in some patients, but 24% of patients in the tocilizumab groups flared within one year or two. So tocilizumab is not a cure for this disease in all patients, to be sure. This is a much better flare rate than the prednisone-only treatment group, but still one in four patients treated with tocilizumab flared. They tended to flare at lower doses than patients on prednisone alone, but they still flared. And this uh, red box cuts through a lot of data and tells you that among the flares that occurred in the tocilizumab-treated um, patients, 50% of them still occurred on at least 5 milligrams of prednisone a day. So there's clearly a spectrum of response in GCA. Some patients will go into uh, remission, taper off steroids, maybe even be able to stop their tocilizumab successfully after a while. Other patients need to be on both drugs. And we do not know how to predict who's going to fall into which category. So when can tocilizumab be stopped? Can it be stopped? We'll have some more data at, about this to present at uh, ULAR. But my patient, one, who had the dry cough and couldn't play tennis anymore, wanted to stop after one year. And this is true for most patients, regardless of whether they have anchor-associated vasculitis or rheumatoid arthritis or GCA. We get them into remission, and they think they're cured, and they don't want to be on treatment forever. And so I usually let patients stop treatment and uh, try, try it out and see how they do. And that's what we did uh, with patient one. And two years later, more than two years later, on not a milligram of prednisone and no tocilizumab, he remains in complete remission, playing tennis multiple times a week, acute phase reactants, including a serum IL-6 concentration, completely normal. How long will it last? I don't know, but I'm really thrilled by the outcome so far. So in summary, the great majority of GCA patients are unsuccessful in tapering their prednisone. Prednisone fails them unless they're treated with something else, and at the moment, that something else <coughs> really is only tocilizumab. More than 80% of flares occur while patients are still on prednisone. A lot of times, 60% uh, 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 of the time, it occurs when patients are on more than 5 milligrams of prednisone a day. Tocilizumab induces steroid-free remission, a uh, greater likelihood of achieving a steroid free sustained remission. It's safer 
than treating patients with steroids alone. That's important to underscore. It's actually safer to use both of the drugs together and to get rid of the prednisone sooner rather than later. And in some patients anyway, tocilizumab might be discontinued safely after one year. More data will be presented about this at UI. So this is Mr. Higgins on the day that I met him. And I went to the ACR to talk about the treatment of refractory giant cell arteritis, ironically, the day he went to surgery. I didn't know whether I would see him alive again. I got back from the ACR. He had survived 13-hour surgery. Our surgeons did an incredible job. He was still unconscious, intubated, and his chest was wide open because he had been given so much fluid at surgery that they couldn't close his chest. The day after that, they took him back to surgery, closed his chest up, and this is his picture now. Uh, and as you can see in this uh, before picture and after picture, prednisone is a great treatment for wrinkles. Um, but uh, beyond that, it has a lot of bad um, side effects. So uh, thank you very much. I'd be delighted to uh, answer any questions. He hasn't been on a milligram of prednisone a day since he went to surgery. Yes. Make sure on tocilizumab and PMR. I know there was some early. Uh, yeah, there were. There have been a couple of small case series that um, seem to indicate that it works quite well. So for patients who can't get off steroids uh, or who have a lot of um, risk factors for poor outcomes on steroids, steroid-induced morbidity, I think it's a very good option. Yes? So in the trial, it was given subcutaneously weekly. There are some data, a lot of data, actually, that indicate that is much better than every other week. It's more effective uh, than using it every other week. Um, it works just as well to give it IV as Mr. Higgins received it. Uh, but there is no FDA approval at the moment for the IV monthly version, 8 milligrams per kilogram. It was recommended, yes. Everyone was uh, calcium and vitamin D were part of the protocol, and other appropriate osteoporosis treatment was recommended. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and about a year after that, she received the surgeon 